Hey there, welcome everyone to the webinar, um, Forming Cooperatives. Um, this is our third in the webinar series that we have um, sponsored by the Asian American Solidarity Economies Project in partnership with um, the UCLA Asian American Studies Center and also National Capacity. So thanks for joining us today. Um, so we have, as I mentioned, this is the third in our series. We have um, two more coming up, one on September 24th, talking about conversions of existing businesses and how micro businesses can cooperate. Um, and also one on the 22nd of October um, about incubating cooperatives. So kind of focusing on you know, worker centers and grassroots community-based organizations um, who are wanting to start up a worker cooperative is a form of building power among their members. You can find out more information about those other two websites and sign up for it on our website, which is solidarityresearch.org forward slash webinars. Um, so uh, just to do um, an introduction of what we're going to talk about today. So our agenda is um, um, I'm going to talk briefly and give some framing. We've got some feedback based on the last two webinars that we've had that folks are really interested in what, what it looks like to build cooperatives and a cooperative ecosystem from more of a, like a, 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 a broader viewpoint, from like a policy standpoint. So I'm going to touch upon some of the innovations that are happening at the city level in terms of municipal policies, and um, which are really being spurred on by social movements at the local level to pass policies that can support uh, cooperatives. Um, and then Ro um, from Red Emma's is going to talk about um, decision making and governance and things that can make cooperatives run smoothly. Um, Ro is a worker owner at Red Emma's Cafe and Bookstore for four years. Through their work, they've co-founded the Baltimore Roundtable for Economic Democracy or BREAD, a local loan fund for worker cooperatives. Red provides high-touch technical assistance paired with non-extractive financing to help co-ops grow and thrive. Ro is currently the educational director at Bread and is happily spreading the good word of cooperatives in Maryland. Um, and then followed um, next will be Annie Sullivan Chin from a bookkeeping cooperative. Um, she's been a worker owner, bookkeeper, and consultant um, at the cooperative since 2013. She began her work um, with ABC as an intern with the Democracy at Work Network, helping ABC craft its cooperative bylaws and operations protocols. She is now a certified DAWN peer advisor, providing customized technical assistance to worker-owned and democratically managed organizations throughout the country. Um, and then our last speaker will be Prague. Um, Prague is a founding principal of Gilmore Kondar LLC, a law firm focused on legal policy and advocacy tools to advance economic justice, racial equity, and social transformation. He teaches at George Washington University Law School, and he also co-founded Baltimore Activating Solidarity Economies, or BASE, um, and the Asian American Solidarity Economies Network, which is the, the project that's bringing you this webinar series. Um, and I'm Yvonne Yen Liu. I'm a co-founder and research director of Solidarity Research Center where um, a worker self-directed nonprofit that advances solidarity economies. Um, I serve on the board of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, um, and I'm also the 2018 Activist in Residence Fellow at the UCLA Asian American Studies Center. Um, so we're going to, you know, after the presentations, we're going to have some, some time for Q&A and discussion. Um, so first to start us off, um, oh, I'm so sorry. I skipped over this slide. Okay, so this is the, these are our all our beautiful panelists, um, and also um, uh, their their Twitter hash their Twitter handles too. So we are tweeting today at hashtag Asian Solidarity. Um, if you want to to join our conversations on there, okay, great. So this is me. So first, um, starting off. So um, according to research by the Democracy at Work Institute, there is over 350 worker cooperatives and democratic workplaces throughout the country. This is not a map of that. <laughs> I'm going to get to that. <laughs> because if this was a map of the number of cooperatives that are currently in the US, it would be populated much more. Um, there's about a 2 to 3% annual increase in the number of cooperatives that are started every year. 
Um, cooperatives employ over 6,000 worker owners and produce um, $395 million in, dollars in revenue every year. Um, and I think, you know, wh what we're seeing right now is um, a lot of cities playing an active role in developing and encouraging and also incentivizing cooperatives to grow. Um, and so this map is a map um, taken from the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives of different cities that have passed policies or ordinances or some kind of legislation that recognizes cooperatives or directly, you know, um, provide some, some type of incentives or assistance for them to, to grow. And I'll be talking a little bit about um, some of those approaches that cities are adopting. A lot of this is based from a case study that Michelle Camus wrote in 2016. Um, I've referenced it on the bottom of this slide. I, it's, a, it's a great read, I'd recommend it. Um, so she talks about, she does a case study of 10 cities that are developing um, cooperatives at the municipal level and breaks down the approaches that cities are taking into um, three types. So the first being the anchor approach. Um, this is where cities provide business loans for worker cooperatives to tap into procurement spending by area anchor institutions. I think the one um, city that's most known for this is Cleveland, where the Evergreen Cooperatives were kind of um, started by a, num by, by a consortium of anchor institutions, including the local hospital and the university. Um, and I think recently there was news about how the Evergreen Cooperatives are expanding right now. Um, so, and this is also a model that's being um, followed in Richmond, Virginia and Rochester, New York. Uh, the second approach is the ecosystem approach. Um, this is um, something that the Democracy at Work Institute um, has been um, looking at a lot in their research. So um, this is where the city provides local capacity to provide education, outreach, technical assistance, and financial support for worker co-op startups or conversions. Um, this is happening also in a number of cities, including Austin, Texas, Madison, Wisconsin, Minneapolis, Minnesota, New York City, and Richmond, California. Um, and then the last approach is the procurement approach. So this is where the city develops bid preferences for worker cooperatives able to meet procurement needs and may develop other types of supports like tax forgiveness, financing, or fast-tracking permits. Um, so this is happening in Berkeley and Oakland, California. I forgot to mention that today we are um, um, unveiling a new uh, uh, thing in our webinars, um, an, a type of Easter egg. I think you can see one currently right now on the slide. Um, we'd love to see how many of folks can actually count and name the, the LOL cats that appear throughout the, the presentation. Um, great. And so um, the Sustainable Economies Law Center has worked on a um, template um, so if, if you're in a city that um, has not passed a cooperative ordinance, you can look to this um, as a template. Um, and they base this on what was passed in Oakland um, as a sort of model. Um, so I definitely recommend checking that out. If, if there isn't um, you know, a similar type of legislation that's been passed in your city, or if you wanna take the existing legislation further. And I see that someone has saw a business cat. Very cool. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pass it on to Ro now. Hi, everyone. I'm Ro. Um, so, again, um, I have been a work at, owner at Emma, Red Emma's, which is a small um, worker owned cafe and bookstore in Baltimore City uh, for the last four years. Uh, but I actually recently uh, transitioned out of that uh, role uh, to take on a full-time uh, job uh, working with developing cooperative with the Baltimore Roundtable for Economic Democracy Bread. Um, so that's an exciting thing. <laughs> um, and kind of what, you, what Yvonne is saying is um, my role in Bread has been both um, education um, and also uh, doing the kind of like hands-on technical assistance with developing cooperatives. Um, right, so just like a fun fact, we were going over this um, at a meeting the other day. Uh, right now we have like $500,000 in loans out in Baltimore um, for six cooperatives. So 
So it's a, it's like a really exciting thing. Um, also, Fred is part of like a national network of local loan funds. Um, that yeah, you should check out. There's probably one near you. Um, cool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about like the two things that I do mainly for co-ops, which are uh, the the technical systems and then the financing. Um, so cool. Um, the first. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about uh, uh, like steps to start up basically. Um, and I'm going to use an example of Pep Foods, which is an awesome worker co-op in Baltimore that we work with. Um, and they have a loan with us. Uh, it's uh, a wholesale vegan food producer. Um, they have a lot of other parts of it. Like they're very, very mission, mission oriented, which like oftentimes cooperatives are. So this is like them doing some, this is Brenda's doing teaching class, a vegan teaching class. And Kyle over here is like serving some food somewhere. It's really good. Um, so, so we, I met with, I met pet, pet foods through Emma's, um, where they, they basically came in and they're like, we want to start a co-op. Y'all are a co-op. And this is how a lot of kind of like peer to peer feedback happens is like people that are interested will come to you and be like, how do you do this? How do you do this? Um, and we were actually getting that a lot in Baltimore. And that's kind of like what we kind of like spurred the idea to start bread, which ha which started about two years ago. So we started working with PEP about two years ago um, and we sat down with them and we were like, okay, like, what do you, you want to start co-op? That's awesome. Like, let's do, let's, let's, let's do that together. Um, what, what's your product? And there are five people, there are five worker owners in the room. And each of them was like, oh, we're going to rent a kitchen space in it. Oh, we're going to like produce wholesale vegan food. We're going to teach classes. And like basically each of them had kind of a different product that they thought was they're going to be like their main product for their business. Um, and they're like, yeah, we can start production tomorrow. We can start renting this out da, 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 as soon as we get like the loan for, um, they basically got a loan for equipment to build out a commercial kitchen. Um, but I was like, we were, all, I we were like, okay, well, let's hold up. We all have to be on the same page about even like what your business is doing, right? Like, what are you selling? What's going on? Um, so a lot of times co-op, especially when they're first starting for a lot of reasons, like money, exciting part you know they just want to jump into the operation stage but there's like a huge amount of work that needs to get done before that um, like really actually doing the thing that you're super passionate about um, before starting that um, so we kind of we went back um, and I and I've outlined a little bit about how like all of the kind of different steps that you need to do before actually even you know doing those things that we hear about like incorporating we all have questions about incorporating funding you know there's a lot of other things to go into first um so the big questions are like who um who is even going to be your decision making body are there different levels of decision making what, what and then from there how are you going to make decisions like what are the decisions that you even need to make um before like before you start a co-op and then also like once you start the co-op, what is it, how are those decisions going to be made? Um, and then also kind of like a really big, this is a more like, you know, existential question, but like, why? Like, why are you, why are you choosing to organize your business in this way? And are each of the participants or worker owners um, goals and mission aligned enough that it will be a cohesive enough, like a uh, body, a decision-making body to be able to move through and make this and make this really happen. So those are kind of the first steps. Who are even the worker owners? Like who is the decision making body? How are you going to make decisions? Um, so trying to define a decision making process before you start making those bigger decisions. Like are we going to take out five hundred thousand dollars in loans together? You know, or incorporate as a business, thus starting to like pay taxes and do all the other fun stuff that being a business owner is. Um, and what are our goals and what are our metrics of assessing those goals and setting those things um, before we can, which is fun. Um, so once you have all those things figured out, which are, you know, it's a huge, it's a huge amount of work in and of itself. And that's kind of where um, we, like Bread, or like co-op developers, like to pump the brakes a little bit, being like, I know you want to jump into production, but we got to like answer these things. 
Um, the next thing is having, um, after setting up the decision making, setting out like a, basically a work plan um, for being like, these are our goals that we want to be met. So we want to have bylaws, bylaws by this time. We, we need to do like a market research. Like can't, once we have identified our product and actually what the thing we're trying to sell is, how will the market hold it? Like, is there enough? Like if, for instance, like M Red Emma's is on a, uh, we can go, with, yeah, Red Emma's is on like a strip that has like five cash space. If another worker owns cash space and wanted to like start there, I'd be like, maybe that market's a little saturated. Like, is there is there another place in Baltimore that could really use that kind of like uh, infrastructure or business? Um, so with starting a work plan, it's uh, it's it's really trying to figure out what are the qualifications um, and interests in the existing decision-making bodies. So of those that are worker owners, um, who has what skills that we are necessary for making this happen? And then what are the things that we need to outsource? So like when do we need to like hit up those uh, grad co-op lawyers, Prague over there, <laughs> and Dorcas and stuff like that? Or like when do we need to like go to a bookkeeping company, like or, yeah, a bookkeeping company and be like, hey, like can you look at this? Can you look this over for me? Um, so really mapping out what you have, so what the market can hold, and then also the skills that the existing like worker owner and body has, um, and figuring out how to fill in um, or use the ones that the fill in the ones that aren't there or use the ones that you already have. Um, and a really exciting tool that I like to use to do this, um, which you can do with your own group if you're maybe starting thinking about starting a co-op, is the business modest business model canvas right yeah um so you can really there's a lot of examples of this there are some that are like more co-op specific because they're a little bit more focused on mission alignment but it really helps you be like this is my product this is my target this are my supporters like this is what we need to like basically meet these are the goals that we need to meet to make this business sustainable feasible um and thrive basically uh, and so it's an awesome tool that you should try and you can do it. It's really, it's like on the internet if you Google this. Um, you can do it and then also come back to it um, through the process. So it's gonna change a lot, especially in the first part of development. Um, cool. Can, wait, can people hear me? Okay, cool, sorry. Um, awesome. Um, so filling out the, trying to fill out like your business model um, and making it really as clear, concise and conservative as possible. Cause you don't really want to set yourself up for like goals that are, you know, at, especially for smaller businesses, a little bit unattainable and not be able to meet them. Cause that's just like a morale pusher downer for, you know, everyone involved. Um, and you also want to set goals that are like realistic. Uh, also, Oh, uh, so it's, sorry, I'm reading the questions as it happens. It's called the Business Model Canvas. And we can send a link out in the follow-up email. Um, cool. Um, and the third thing, so after you have kind of like the decision-making body set, um, you have uh, your, a really clear idea of what, your, of what your market is and stuff like that, uh, what your market is, everyone's role in it, and you're like, okay, this is real. Like we all understand what we're agreeing to. We're starting this business together. <laughs> um, is uh, when you really should start thinking about um, uh, catalyzing or financing your project or your business. Um, and I was asked to put together like a little slide about ways to finance uh, worker co-ops, which I have on the next slide. Cool. Um, so we actually, ha I have a longer handout that kind of goes into more detail about all these different ways. And this is obviously not exhaustive. Um, there's like worker co-ops are super innovative in figuring out like, how are we gonna make this work? Um, and really you're probably gonna use like a combination of all these things together uh, to finance a business. Um, so just to go over them, let's do it. Um, you could do it out of pocket. So if you know, you've been, if the worker owners have been like really saving up for the specific um, opening and stuff like that, or, you know, have money with them, have money already, you can just finance it out of pocket. 
Um, that's not often the case for worker co-ops. Um, none of the ones that I've worked with have really been um, able to do that. But uh, so we've been we've used like a you know some financing from the worker owners, but uh, also so some financing from the worker owners. Oh, you're, okay, great. Bring it up. Um, the other thing is uh, worker owner capital count uh, contributions. So this is actually a way that Emma's um, brings uh, brings in money into the uh, co-op. Is people oftentimes people that work at Emma's don't have like the uh, the buy-in for when they're offered a position or wo offer worker ownership at Emma's. So the way that we do it um, is taking 50 cents per hour of their wage up to the point up to like the amount of the buy-in. Um, so it's not actually just this like lump sum that you have to put in immediately when you become a worker owner because most people don't have that money lying around, but it's like built up um, ca like capitalization into the business. Um, loans from friendly from friends and family is another way. So asking for low or no interest loans from a bunch of people that kind of could be like paired with crowdfunding, which is another way that a lot of uh, co-ops get initial seed money or money for equipment. Um, recently, you could get uh, lo traditional loans from uh, business from banks or credit unions, but oftentimes credit unions or banks, uh, which are more traditional lenders, um, require collateral, personal collateral from individuals, um, which is can just can be a barrier for a lot of people if they don't have their credit. Um, also, it kind of creates this imbalance of who. So one person is taking up the loan for the business. Um, it's their house on the line versus like kind of like a more shared way, a shared way of um, financing. So that the burden and the responsibility is um, shared for all the worker owners. Um, also, it can create this like imbalance, like oh, I took it out, so like maybe I should have more say in where the money goes, and really trying to eliminate that, eliminate that um, uncomfortableness, uh, or and also like inequity on structural level. Um, another one is uh, co-op friendly lenders. So like I was saying, um, the Baltimore Roundtable for Economic Democracy, Bread, is a lender that does non-extractive financing paired um, paired with high touch technical assistance and really like understands co-ops um, and that it's going to be a complicated ownership structure. It's going to take a lot of initial investment of time and energy um, and that, you know, often won't make money for a little, like make money initially. So um, kind of pegging spending, pegging like uh, repayment of the loans to uh, target hit instead of just being like, oh, you need to start paying this loan back the month after you get it. Um, and we can go, I can go more into detail about that if people have questions. Um, and then kind of like what Yvonne is saying there, uh, a lot of like governments, a lot of local governments, uh, state and city are putting money into co-ops or doing tax breaks into co-ops and um, that's another way to get it. Uh, yeah, so I'm happy to answer any more questions about financing or steps to start up. That's just the beginning. Uh, there's a lot of material out there um, and thanks so much. And I'm gonna pass it off to Danny. Great, thank you. Um, that was a great, thank you, Ro. That was a really good introduction um, on like important questions to consider and uh, options on how to finance your co-op. And um, so I'm gonna pick it up with uh, digging a little bit more uh, deeply into the topics of, um, of co-op accounting uh, and financial uh, concepts. And, um, and then we'll segue with that. I'm gonna touch a little bit on the legal stuff, but I'm gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna hold off on um, the bulk of it to, uh, to Paragra legal expert here who will be um, speaking after me. So uh, as, as Yvonne said, I, was, I am a member of the a worker owner of a bookkeeping cooperative. Um, I'm using those terms interchangeably, member and worker owner, and uh, that will come up again in, um, in, a, in one of my next slides. Um, but what I want to do, oh, and also I am a um, peer advisor with the Democracy at Work Network. Um, and uh, similar to Ro, kind of ro arose from a need, a local need for technical assistance from people that are practicing worker 
um, ownership. Um, so that is the premise of the Democracy at Work Network, um, the Peer Advisor Network, uh, which uh, per currently is a project of the US Federation of Worker Co-ops. So I have that hat as well as I bring my technical assistance um, knowledge to the table. Um, uh, can you do the next slide, please, Yvonne? So I'm actually going to start by not talking about my co-op um, and what we do, but I would like to start by uplifting a, a, an example of a worker co-op that was founded within the last couple of years here in New York City. Um, this co-op is called Maharlika Cleaning Cooperative. Um, they are um, the founding worker owners were a product of a sort of a joint project between the Damayan Migrant Workers Association and um, Center for Family Life. And Maharlika Cleaning Cooperative, um, which again spun off of the Damayan Cleaning Cooperative um, that was co-incubated by those two organizations I mentioned, uh, is the first Filipino migrant worker-owned cooperative in the United States. Uh, the majority of their worker owners are labor trafficking survivors. Uh, through mutual aid, education, and dignified jobs, they envision creating a society based in harmony, unity, and respect, liberated from forced labor and family separation. Uh, that is an excerpt from a uh, portion of the um, Worker Cooperative Business Development, Business Development Initiative Report for 2018 um, that may or may not have been published yet. If it hasn't yet, it will be published soon. And the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative is, by the way, an example of one of the ways that New York City is uh, funding worker cooperative development. So Maharlika Cleaning Cooperative I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this in my next slide. But uh, they are receiving technical assistance currently um, and formerly through nonprofit organizations that um, whose mission is to support and provide jobs, training, and education, leadership development um, through the vehicle of worker cooperative uh, development. So Damayan Cleaning LLC was the first is the first iteration of the cooperative um, and it was incorporated and launched in 2015. This uh, cooperative was actually funded entirely by crowdfunding and um, out of pocket and donations mostly um, were supported the uh, initial the pre the startup expenses of the cooperative um, and they had a, a very a very uh, thorough marketing um, campaign and a launch party uh, that I went to and was very fun and inspiring. And, um, and I just wanna point out that while uh, it is, as Ro mentioned, uh, less common to see worker cooperatives that are funded out of their own pocket, um, I would say there, there, was a, there was a lower capital requirement for this particular cooperative and others like it in New York City because of the business development and technical assistance resources that are being directed towards nonprofit organizations to incubate and train. So they are getting that value. Um, and as Ro also alluded to, when you're forming a cooperative, you have to make a lot of decisions that are not always easy. Um, you have to decide how to decide. You have to um, you know, consider scenarios that haven't even played out yet um, within, your, within your cooperative. And um, what happened, ended up happening in this example is a few, some of the members, some of the founding members of Damayan Cleaning um, separated and parted ways with the Damayan Cleaning Cooperative and formed a new cooperative named Maharlika Cleaning, um, also incorporated as an LLC. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, there are a couple of other organizations that support, um, support, supported and continue to support uh, Maharlika Cleaning Cooperative. That is the Center for Family Life um, in Brooklyn, and they are supporting Maharlika in the form of job skills training, um, such as uh, computer skills, leadership skills, office management, um, project management. Um, that type of thing. They have a program that is called a, a Leadership Institute, uh, and it is a 10 week long program that they're uh, the co op, some uh, self identified leaders of the co ops um, attend weekly sessions um, to, to improve these uh, types of skills. They also um, have received 
and my cooperative also has received legal services uh, free to us by Urban Justice Center. That is um, specifically their community development project, uh, which that has been providing legal services to worker co-ops, again, under the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative. Um, incredibly valuable legal services, uh, like help with startup documents, like operating agreements, bylaws, um, articles of incorporation, uh, et cetera. And then um, my cooperative, or the cooperative that I'm, of which I'm a member, um, a bookkeeping cooperative um, has been with Maharlika and Damayan since day one, um, providing bookkeeping um, support. We actually, they decided uh, down the, I think, 2016 um, to hire uh, ABC, my co-op, to do the bookkeeping, the day-to-day -day bookkeeping. Um, but until then, we were training someone within the co-op to do bookkeeping. And that's a familiar relationship that we have with our clients at ABC, um, is we'll train them to do it if they want to. And we can also do it if they decide they don't want to do it anymore. They want to focus on other things. Um, part of the trainings that we provided, like I said, was to support the co-op in their own sort of financial management systems and how they do their bookkeeping, how they, um, you know, file their documents, uh, et cetera. We also um, did a, a couple of workshops on um, personal, like individual tax implications and how to, um, as I am not a tax professional myself, um, we have, a, we have close relationships with uh, accountants and tax professional tax preparers that we work with on a regular basis. And um, with that caveat, I was able to sit and you know, do a couple of workshops with Maharlika to um, estimate their in personal income taxes um, based on their individual situations so that they could make their quarterly estimated tax payments to the, um, to the IRS and to New York State. Um, so that was a, a mode of supporting the sort of personal financial management as well as the co-op. Next slide. And so just to conclude this little case study, um, I wanted to share uh, some of the more recent press um, that, uh, that for, for Maharlika, um, they're a, a tremendously, um, a tremendously inspirational um, group of, uh, group of people and I am honored to be working with them. So if uh, I'm sure you can, um, these, links, these links are live, so you can also, and you can also visit their website um, at maharlikacleaning.coop slash testimonials, and you can see, read the rest of the press um, and read testimonials, and you can also read their story and their words on their website. So the next thing that we'll be looking at is I suppose I um, just checking in on the questions actually, um, which is there was a question, are the services by the supporting organizations from Maharlika Cleaning Co-op free? Um, the answer is yes. So the next, um, the next slide is, as you can see, we're kind of digging into a little bit more of the um, technical nature of um, co-op accounting. And um, this is a, a very, very simple version of a table that I've seen various iterations of, um, usually made by co-op lawyers, uh, that are extremely helpful resources. And I know probably it's gonna go more into the legal entity conversation um, when it's his turn. But for now, I'm essentially speaking from my own experience as a worker owner and, um, at ABC, which is a cooperative corporation in New York State. Um, so that's a specific statute to the state of New York. And, um, and I'm comparing that to a limited liability company or an LLC, um, mainly to illustrate some larger differences between the way that the accounting works um, between these two types of entities. And in my experience, these are very common entities um, to choose. So there's definitely more to um, explore in terms of legal entity, um, but I was just using this uh, sort of one-to-one -one comparison um, between cooperative corporation and LLC to illustrate some of the highlights. 
So the first, uh, the first one thing I wanted to talk about was the um, member investment. Um, as many of you know already, there's a um, typically members contribute capital. There's a cooperative principle also that um, states that members are participate economically in the co-op. Um, so typically that reads as a um, as an investment and the way that we treat the investment on the books with a cooperative corporation is a uh, stock payment. So your initial investment would be a share of stock um, that you buy and the company um, whose value um, you can, which is whose value is set um, by the board of directors and you can find that information in your bylaws and startup documents. And um, as opposed to, so the LLC and no matter, I'm sorry, no matter how many shares of stock you own in a cooperative corporation, um, you still only get one vote. So that is the, that is a sort of the, the more, um, just more firm co-op, uh, the tenets of cooperative um, businesses that one, one, uh, one member equals one vote. In an LLC, that tenant is still the same. One member equals one vote. Um, the investment is uh, looks a little bit different. Um, in the LLC, the member investment um, opens up the capital account um, as it does with a cooperative corporation. But what we call this is not a stock payment. It's um, it's just a contribution to that owner's equity account. And in terms of the treatment. Um, for uh, the cooperative corporation uh, in terms of the in terms of like a labor category um, in a cooperative corporation at least in the 5a statute that where ibc is incorporated under in new york state uh, members are considered employee owners so all of our members are paid through payroll um, as uh, we we have salaries um, as you can see in the next bullet um, members can be also be paid with wages um, of a cooperative corporation. We have all the withholdings uh, for income tax taken out. We have pay, we pay the um, social security, Medicaid, et cetera, payroll taxes. Um, we are subject to labor laws, um, both state and federal. And um, that is different from an LLC in which members are considered owners um, as it's not and not employees of the co-op. Um, payment for members in an LLC uh, is called, are called guaranteed payments. Um, so members are compensated for their labor with uh, guaranteed payments um, as opposed to salaries or wages. And there are no taxes taken out um, of the guaranteed payments, which means that members are responsible for um, estimating and uh, paying and filing their income tax return. Well, we all have to, we're all expected to file our income tax return, but Members are expected to pay their estimated taxes quarterly throughout the year, um, as opposed to getting it with help from our paychecks. Um, the last distinction that I wanted to draw was that members, um, how do we share profit? Um, because in a cooperative, we share profits and we share losses. Um, the treatment of how we share profit and loss is, uh, can be different um, from co-op to co-op, but um, especially loss, um, I see loss shared equally more often than um, proportionately, but profit sharing is most often uh, done proportionately based on some calculation. Um, in, for the, the IRS definition of a cooperative, in order for it to um, meet the IRS definition of a cooperative, the federal definition of a cooperative, um, Members uh, must share profits based with patronage dividends based on a number, a calculation of hours worked. So the proportionality of how we share profits is based on hours worked uh, with uh, with a um, with a with a cooperative corporation. Um, with an LLC, the members share profit with net profit allocations, and those allocations can be based on various formulas. Um, the key distinction from a tax standpoint, as from the individual is that um, any, any profit share from an owner of, uh, from a worker owner in an LLC is uh, included in their income tax uh, return. It's included in their income tax document that they receive from the co-op at the end of the year called a K-1 as opposed to a W-2. You get a K-1 from a, an LLC and the K-1 lists your profit share as taxable income um, as opposed to patronage dividends, which is a form of dividend um, and you get a, a 1099, a form of 1099 for that and the treatment of taxes is, is different. 
Um, so those are sort of those sort of a semi-brief um, overview of um, some of the highlights, some of the key differences in accounting between as it relates to um, legal entity between cooperative um, corporations and LLC co-ops. So um, the very last slide, um, if I'll ask you just to jump us up one, Yvonne. So the very last slide is just, um, uh, is just a list of some resources. The first um, is our website, bookkeeping.coop slash resources. Uh, we have a lot of kind of accounting specific resources on our website in addition to co-op, general co-op resources. Um, if you'd like to know more about some of the part uh, about the Urban Justice Center um, community development project, which I've mentioned several times, um, their website is there. Um, they can very, um, they have a whole team that's devoted to cooperative development. Um, we also referenced uh, the Democracy at Work Institute. Um, Yvonne mentioned a statistic. So they are sort of our think and do tank um, of, in the cooperative, um, and that's how, they, that's how they call themselves. They have a resource guide that's extremely um, robust. Uh, it's available, it has resources in English and in Spanish. Um, and I'm also recommending a short animated video called How Co-Worker Cooperatives Work um, that was put together by a colleague called, um, named Joe Marafino, who works at the Democracy at Work Institute. And it's a very um, nice breakdown. Um, and lastly, it's, um, we're going to be launching a toolkit, um, that, a toolkit that is separate from the toolkit that you'll receive um, from, from, this, uh, from this project. Um, but this is a collaboration between ABC uh, and a couple other uh, professional facilitators and curriculum developers called How Can We Make More Money? A Values-Based Finance Education Kit. Um, and so keep an eye out for that. And there's, you can click on the link to learn more um, and donate if you possibly can. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. Um, there's a lot of knowledge there. And so um, we, um, I'm going to talk briefly. Um, as Yvonne said, <clears throat> I um, have a, a law firm um, with my partner Dorcas Gilmore, and we work on a range of things uh, with community-based enterprise, nonprofits, hybrids, and, uh, and co-ops. Um, that all being said, um, there are a good number of people who you know are professionals in the space, but who haven't actually been in a co-op, and and that is why um, having Ro and Annie, um, you know, as as presenters here, and Yvonne. Um, people who um, have actually done this, who are actually doing this, um, who are going through this uh, firsthand, uh, is really critical. There are uh, so-called experts who can be helpful and also sometimes have opinions that aren't grounded in the day-to-day -day reality. And, and so strongly encourage um, folks to reach out um, to the people here. And, and we know peers and other people who, who we know and trust um, across the, the country who also have this kind of experience. Um, that all being said, um, I've got some things to talk about um, on the legal end. Um, so really quickly, this is a slide that I try, I've kind of pulled together um, with my partner. Um, why would you talk to a lawyer? Um, sometimes talking to a lawyer is actually awful, and um, <laughs> I get that. And so, um, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about worker and co-ops, and, you know, I want to just try to gear this toward also, like, thinking about... Um, social service providers, organizers, others working directly in Asian American communities and other communities as well. Um, this concept of a worker-owned co-op, some, some parts of it may seem familiar and some of it may be like, what is this, right? And the idea is owning your labor, um, uh, having uh, more um, autonomy and self-determination within your workspace and therefore within your lives, right? And then within your communities. And that is really like a fundamental basis for some of this. Um, you know, we don't feel, or I don't feel that worker co-ops are the answer to everything. And um, often labor exploitation is like a really fundamental piece that, you know, distorts and messes up people's lives. And so, um, so the why, the why is something I'm going to get back to in terms of uh, good practice. Why? Um, so um, I think, um, the why here is why do you talk to a lawyer? And uh, in a life cycle of a co-op or even any small business um, or a nonprofit, um, you have the idea phase, the start, these are you know, just things that you know, we kind of thought through, like idea, startup, maturation, expansion, transition to solution. 
uh, different elements of this are actually built in or baked into or should be baked into your conversations at, at, at the beginning with the people you're collaborating with um, and in the documents and you know formal sort of agreements that you have amongst yourselves. Um, and there's these different phases to projects, initiatives, campaigns of your organizers and, and uh, businesses. Um, and so there are some basic things and we'll have these slides available so I'm not gonna go through everything here. But um, in the idea phase, um, some basics. Uh, you heard some really fundamental basics around um, money, around uh, uh, organizing your money, around governance, around decision making. Um, and um, lawyers can be helpful. Um, some of the toolkits are really helpful to just give you some basics of these are things to keep in mind. Uh, but really understanding the why is super important. We can click to the next slide. Thank you. Oh, and my, my, uh, if you ever talk to a lawyer, this is not legal advice. Um, we say that because, you know, your specific example, your specific point, um, the specific things that you're trying to do, uh, the facts are really important, where your base is really important, who's involved is really important. And so I'm trying to give as much information without um, saying this is the answer to your specific question. Um, okay, what entity? This is the thing, like what is this thing supposed to look like? Um, so entity means um, what is the container, um, the official thing in the state or in the District of Columbia or in Puerto Rico that is recognized by the state. And you have usually have to create something. And um, it is governed by state law, so it's different in different um, jurisdictions. Um, as I said, it's a container for the cooperative. Um, the internal organization that Ro um, spoke of, that Annie spoke of, um, that you've heard of uh, in the other two webinars and other things that you may have read or seen is really important. How do you, how do you all relate to one another? Uh, how are decisions made? That's super important, and that gets baked into um, this thing. Um, now, this is different from the federal tax treatment. Uh, which Andy spoke uh, to. And so people talk about tax exemption, um, and then there's different kinds of taxation, um, and, um, and then there's also cooperative taxation. And again, I'm not a tax expert, um, but just recognizing that these are, this is related to that, and it's different from. Um, and, and as I said here, I mean, or I said before, there's not a one size fits all solution. Um, and this is an active conversation uh, amongst uh, people who are thinking about the finances, uh, people who are thinking about funding it, um, people who provide technical assistance and co-op developers, um, lawyers, et cetera, and actual cooperators with on the ground experience. This is a really active um, discussion and it's very much in flux and it depends on who you're working with. So uh, I'll get into that a little bit. If we can get to the next slide. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, one entity, there's all kinds of stuff. Like there's all these things, boom, pow, you know, like B Corp, what does that mean? A cooperative corporation, you've heard of this, public benefit corporation, there's a flexible purpose corporation in California. There's like new things being created and then, um, you know, uh, kind of like moved away from. Uh, there are a bunch of different things. Some of them aren't even entities, like a B Corp is just the status, it's not actually an entity. Um, again, we can't get into all this right now, but the point is there are a lot of options. And I have heard people say, should I form, can I, should I form a worker owned cooperative using a state that has a worker owned cooperative statute? So for example, Massachusetts and is it Wisconsin, Minnesota or Wisconsin that people all often talk about. Um, I do know they're different. And, um, uh, you know, should I just form it there and then even though I'm a Maryland, you know, company or I'm a, you know, company based like in uh, Georgia and I'm not really going to do anything around the country. Um, that is a complicated question. I tend to say no um, because um, you have to deal with two states then and the feds. And that's a lot of extra regulatory stuff. Um, so my quick answer, and again, it depends on your situation, um, is that's actually more of a more of a headache and a hassle for a startup. Um, and, um, you know, I, I tend to say, if you know that you're going to be in one jurisdiction, try to figure out the best fit in that jurisdiction. Um, so if you're in New York, try to figure out what's the best fit in New York and, and people can help you and guide you and give you, you know, feedback. Um, but, um, there's a lot to maintain a, a company in two different jurisdictions if you don't have to. Um, okay. So next slide, please. Um, 
key considerations, as I said, governance and control, um, taxation, where's the money going to come from? Um, the members we, you know, we talked about, but if you're looking at loans, if you're looking, if you're thinking, hey, we want grant funding, if we're thinking we want, um, we want to give a stake in the company to people who invest, you know, still keeping in mind that uh, worker on co-op, you know, you know, we, to be true to the cooperative principles, those investors really shouldn't have a vote um, unless they're also working. Um, and then employment considerations. Do we want to be considered as employees? Um, Annie, um, you know, spoke of this, that, you know, from out, out of the gate, if you don't have a lot of money and you're, you're working to build that capital, um, do you want the company to bear some of the, um, the uh, responsibilities if you have employees? So the employment taxes, um, the federal employment taxes, um, and some other responsibilities. Um, and, you know, if you're working with folks who are undocumented, what does that mean? Uh, what structure would be helpful or supportive if you have mixed status in terms of your community members that are, are working together? Um, if you do feel like there's grant money that could come in um, and there's a nonprofit that's incubating this, is there some relationship between the nonprofit and this, this thingy? <laughs> this, um, you know, this, this project, it could be that for some period of this timeline, it is incubated within the nonprofit and then it spins off. And that is like with Center for Family Life in New York, that's a common model. Um, and, and with others, um, with Prospera in uh, the Bay Area and a number of other places. Um, and I think, uh, you know, speaking to an audience, uh, you know, a mixed audience right now and people who watch this for Asian American nonprofit organizations, this is the thing to consider. Uh, if you have a community base, uh, if you have people who you're serving, if you have elders and young people and uh, working age folks who are coming through, that you could you could incubate worker-owned co-ops, um, and or you could have a part of a program, a training program, uh, in which grant money is flowing through uh, that is providing stipends to people. Again, this is very could be complicated, and you have to think this through. But I have worked with uh, worker co-ops that have you know, that are separate, their own entity, and they have a training component that is separate also and funded through grant money. Um, and so there are ways to do this. Personal finances, organizational finances, being really clear about these lines, uh, you do, it is helpful to have guidance from either co-op developers or other people who have this experience. Um, okay, we can click um, and I'll talk quickly about the next things. Some employment law considerations. Employment laws are not always a perfect fit for worker co-ops. Um, uh, just, you know, I'm not going to go into the history of work in this country, uh, but stolen labor, stolen wages, stolen lives. Um, happy to talk about this on all of us would be happy to talk about this. And that's why some of these laws have been created. Um, they were created through community action, through, uh, people in the streets, um, and, and fighting back against, uh, you know, uh, traditional capitalism that just tries to squeeze every penny out of everybody. And recognizing that is important. That is a context here because those laws are good and they're not optional. Um, and so uh, even if everybody involved says, hey, we agree that we're gonna get paid $3 an hour um, until year one or until we make X amount of money, um, you, can't, you can't actually do that. Um, and so you have to figure out how you can, uh, what I mean by you can't actually do that is these are not waivable rights. Um, and even if everyone agrees and it's like, well, who's going to, who's going to look, we have a five person or a 10 person worker on co-op. Who's going to look? Um, it's just to keep in mind that, uh, at any given time, somebody may have a disagreement and, uh, you know, that, that, uh, disagreement or anything that comes outside of the worker on co-op, things don't always work out. Um, that, uh, that conversation with the regulators will bring the regulators very quickly because they don't fool around when it comes to employment law. Um, even though there's so much abuse out there, um, you know, regulators around employment law and tax, it's not really something to play around with. Um, okay, next slide, please. Uh, and here's some quick things, just wage an hour, wage payment, collection, employment non-discrimination. This is a great example. I had a, a co-op, uh, an organization we worked with, a co-op that said, hey, can we just say like, you know, no white guys, please, please no white guys apply. And it was like, you know, the, the point of it being like, we want this to be a really inclusive workspace and, you know, et cetera, is great. And no, you can't do that because these non-discrimination laws uh, cover everyone, not just, um, uh, you know, communities or individual, individuals who are part of groups that have been uh, marginalized in the past or, or currently. 
Uh, and so you can strongly encourage um, if you, I was asked, can we say we strongly, 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 strongly encourage? And you know, that, <laughs> that is, uh, that's, a, that's a thing that you have to kind of like craft with, with uh, some, some level of thinking. Um, uh, unemployment insurance, workers' comp is a major, major issue to keep in mind when it comes to workers, worker-owned co-ops um, and, uh, and the structure that you choose. Um, and occupational safety and health also comes up. Um, next slide, I think that might be it. Oh, one back. Um, really quickly, um, people ask, who do we talk to? Um, the legal stuff is important, at least to have some, some resources. There are more and more people um, coming together. There is, uh, 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 there are community economic development, small enterprise, and I mean, social enterprise and small business law clinics um, at law schools, and they offer free services. It's, you have to be at the right time um, and you have to be the right kind of project to fit. But, but I'm happy to give resources to people because that's a great, you get a lot of time. Um, Salk has a great website. There's a Sustainable Economies Law Center um, for some basics on co-op law for DIY and just trying to get acquainted with some of these questions. And then you can feel free to email me. Um, I'm happy to, or, or um, ping me in any other way because I'm, I'm happy to uh, guide you to somebody who you know, I, I know or we know that are useful. All right, um, thank you so much. Sorry that we went uh, just to the time, but we can take any last minute questions if anyone has any, or any other comments from our panelists. So we've, we've had a lot of questions come up um, over the Q&A box, which I think we've addressed as they've come along. Um, I mean, just to say, I think folks were asking about funding supports in specific areas, funding and legal supports in Los Angeles. So, you know, we're happy to get, you know, email us and we're happy to put you in contact with um, folks. Okay, we have a, a question right now from Jessica. Is there a business structure that's better for getting group health insurance? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, anyone want to take, uh, Prague, do you want to take that? Is there a business structure? structure. I, um, I don't know. Um, I think, I'm not gonna venture a guess on that one. I think that, that that is actually a good question to ask to an insurance agent. Um, if there's any particular weird thing with insurance, I mean, I, I don't like insurance companies, but <laughs> um, if there's any particular thing when it comes to health insurance, I know that with, Workers comp and uh, Ro, I know you could talk to this, but with workers comp, it is it is actually a, a, a it is there is an issue there, but with um, with business structure, I'm not sure. Um, there may be some weird things about um, about the different structures, but I don't know when it comes to health insurance. So I, I wish I could answer that more clearly. But that is a good one to um, yeah. Oh, and Annie said, go ahead, Annie. Hey, yeah, I was just um, wanted to put out there another resource for, um, I know that the US Federation of Worker Co-ops is working on this as a project for their members as a member benefit. Um, they already offer uh, group plans for dental and vision. Um, so I would reach out to them, um, to the Federation, and we can, um, we can provide that content information in the follow-up email. Great. Um, so how many LOL cats do folks have folks counted? Um, if you could put that in the chat box, that would be great. Um, I, th I think in terms of other last questions, so we'll share the resources for um, the business model canvas. Um, yeah, and um, someone's asking for your email address. Let me go back a slide then, because it has everyone's email addresses. Um, if you That's want to- I just typed it in too. Oh, cool, okay. Um, and if you want to get links to previous webinars, they're at solidarityresearch.org. They're, they're all archived there, as will this one. Um, and links to all of the resources there. Um, and I just want to remind folks that in September, we have um, our fourth webinar on um, converting, converting existing businesses into cooperatives or you know, um, how to get existing micro businesses to work together cooperatively. So, um, definitely join that. And I think Prague wanted to make one last shout out for Space Cats Against Fascism. Yes, the, the cat theme. Thank you, Yvonne. It's uh, fun. And, and, you know, also um, there is a new board game um, called Space Cats uh, Fight Fascism by um, the TISA Collective uh, Cooperative out of um, 
New England. They're a worker-owned co-op that creates uh, educational tools and games, really great games, including Coopoly and a number of other games. Uh, this is a new game that's on its way out. Um, and um, I think I, I linked to the Kickstarter. Uh, this isn't, you know, asking people to, to donate to it or anything, but um, but check it out because they're also a little bit under attack, I think, uh, by right-wing fascist groups. But um, but the cats are cute. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining, everyone. And we will see you after our summer hiatus in September. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.